Okay, so let's, um, oh, it's working. I was going to say, let's, let's say a prayer to the gods of audiovisuals. <laughs> and it, <laughs> it seems it worked. Hello, Ukraine. Hello, Kiev. How are you doing this morning? <laughs> Let's, let's give the sound people a couple of minutes to adjust the volume because I'm like loud and they are you're not used to this kind of <laughs> volume. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Angel. That's rather unpronounceable for many of you. Maybe only for the Israeli friends that we have around here. Hello, yeah, I know that you are proficient in this uh, sound that we do. Also in Spain, very Mediterranean. <laughs> but for the northern people, it's like really difficult. So Angel is nice. Angel? Uh, I realized that Angel is like a woman's name in most of the world. So when I go to the States and they are expecting Mrs. Medinilla and I show up, there's like a big of a surprise. <laughs> so anyway, a uh, small introduction, my vanity slide. Um, I was a project manager for telecommunication companies like for 10, 12 years, ages ago. You know, project management, like deep, hardcore PMI project management. <laughs> And then on 2007, I started freelancing and consulting as an agile consultant, and guess what? It worked. I wrote a couple of books, spoke in a lot of conferences all around Europe. I started working in Latin America, like in 2014, and this year, just for the fun, I started working also in Korea, Malaysia, and some Asian countries. So yes, now I have hundreds of customers in 12 time zones, which means I'm screwed. Uh, everyone is calling me 5 a.m. in the morning, no matter where I am in the world, <laughs> so I have to shut down my phone. But it's fun. Um, I've managed, I've been so lucky as to work with uh, telecommunication companies, electronics, video games, pharma, medical companies, government, military, aerospace, retail, dot coms, tourism, you name it. Uh, there's, there's a cheese factory in Spain that is one of my customers. They called me one day and I go, hello, yeah, we are a cheese factory. And I was like, sorry, wrong number. <laughs> But they called again, and I was like, no, we're going to do Scrum. Uh, scrum in a cheese factory? What do you mean? <laughs> it was fun. It was nice. <laughs> and I've learned a couple of things about the topic of this lecture today, which is uh, changing cultures, changing big companies. Um, the last big project that I was involved, um, I'm still like in touch with these people. This is a Colombian bank, 60,000 people, five countries, and we made a huge, huge cultural change over five years, and it's been amazing. I'm so proud of them. Not of me, I'm always doing the same stuff. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but these guys, these guys are really amazing, and I've learned so much, and I hope to uh, maybe exchange with you some ideas of things you might want to try in your companies in order to uh, change the culture, if that's your situation. So, okay, this is my token kitten. I always put a kitten on my presentations. Okay, so look at the kitten, remember the kitten. And the reason I put a kitten in my presentations, if you don't know it already, is that if you put kittens in your presentation, you get 25% better feedback at the end of it. That's guaranteed, okay? It doesn't matter what bullshit I'm going to be talking about over the next 45 minutes. There were kittens in the presentations and they were cute, right? <laughs> So now you can use that, that trick also. <laughs> so how long do I have? Because I have like 35 slides to go. Uh, where's my timekeeper? Who's my timekeeper now? Somebody's my timekeeper, yeah. So I have like 40 minutes maybe, right now? 45 minutes starting now? Okay, I think I might rock that. <laughs> so okay, let's start, let's go, let's move on. Have you ever been in this situation where you had this clever idea uh, like, hey, how about we do cross-functional teams instead of working on silos? Hey, how about we post the work in the wall instead of documents, PowerPoints, project management charts, whatever? Or hey, how about we start delivering small increments of a product every two weeks? That's so smart, right? It's a very, very good idea. And then somebody immediately <laughs> killed that idea. They just don't. They don't care to just try to understand what you're talking about. It's like, no, they shoot it down, like immediately, like fast, like from the hip. And, and then you start listening to these kind of sentences. I'm sure you're familiar with them. That will never work here. What do you mean here? Here in this room, here in this floor of the building, here in Kiev, here in Ukraine, here in Europe? Where is here? What do you mean here? Where's the line where you say, it's working, it's working, it's working, now it's not working, it doesn't work here. <laughs> It makes no sense, right? There's no rational argument behind that. Or maybe sometimes they are like, oh, we don't have time for that. Uh, I mean, we are always busy. 
uh, we all have 24 hours a day, and it's a matter of what do we do with those 24 hours. Either we do this or we do something else, but we don't have time. It's like the good for all excuse. Mm? It's like, I don't have time to play tennis. No, that's a lie. You prefer to do other things than playing tennis. But if you say, I'm a lazy ass, fat, brownie munching, serious bunging p person, and I, don't, I prefer that to play tennis, you don't feel good about yourself. So you prefer to say, I don't have the time. So now it's not your fault, it's the time's fault. Hmm? So you are looking for somebody with a sand clog in the, w in the hand, and, uh, and you know how they call you call that, the, the spare or whatever, mm, dressed in black. You're looking for time, and then you want to beat time because he is the guilty. He's to be blamed for all the problems in your life. I don't have the time. It feels so good. Mm? Or that's not the way we do things around here. I love that one. Sometimes I'm training people, I'm coaching people, and I'm explaining, well, this is how you create chapters and guilds and communities of practice and teams. And somebody says, uh, excuse me, that's not the way we are organized here. And I'm like, that's why I'm telling you. <laughs> so you try this instead of that. <laughs> so what kind of argument is we are not organized that way or that's not the way we do things around here? That's the reason I'm bringing a new idea. So we try something different. So anyway, no, like for instance, <laughs> another one. Yeah, but how about this other stuff, which is so important? That's what I call the squirrel approach. Have you ever seen Up, this Disney movie, uh, I don't know, Pixar movie, where there's this dog that has like attention deficit, and he's like, oh, well, distracted, and he's like, no, I'm suffering for this attention deficit. Squirrel! <laughs> he's always, <laughs> squirrel, squirrel! <laughs> so they try to bring your attention to something different, and usually all these kind of sentences are a sign of change resistance, okay? So, it's very easy when you find this kind of resistance over and over and over to fall into what we call the attribution mistake. The attribution mistake has a very complicated explanation, but basically it consists on uh, looking around, uh, looking at your left, looking at your uh, right, and suddenly you realize, I am surrounded by idiots. And that explanation is amazing because it explains everything, okay? If I'm surrounded by idiots, that's the reason of everything. Suddenly everything makes sense. All the nonsense, all the bullshit, all the things I've been uh, dealing with, it's because I'm surrounded by idiots. And your brain loves that explanation because one, it's not your fault, it's somebody else's fault. And two, it's so simple. And your brain loves simple explanations. That's the reason that we always say, oh, but the, the president doesn't want to. The executive managers doesn't want to. We don't have the support from the managers. That's not the whole truth. There's a lot of things you could be doing without the support of your managers, but you love simple explanations. I don't have time. It will never work here. I'm surrounded by idiots, okay? That's the attribution mistake. And then you change companies. You say, I'm surrounded by idiots. I quit. You go to another company. At the beginning, you are so excited. Two years later, guess what? You are surrounded by idiots. <laughs> Again, <laughs> and you keep going and going and going, and then one day I'm like, wait, this thing is repeating over and over and over. Maybe there's a more complex, maybe more right explanation about what's happening here. And um, the real explanation here is that you are ignoring change dynamics. You are in love with an idea, call it agility, call it whatever, call it uh, holacracy, uh, call it sociocracy. It doesn't matter. Whenever you're trying to introduce a change in a group of people, if you're trying, if you're talking to the people in the school where your kids are at school and you're trying to introduce an emotional intelligence subject in the syllabus of the of the oh thank you. In the syllabus of the of the training of your kids, like you're trying to convince other fathers, hey, how about we teach emotional intelligence to our kids? They're gonna say, Oh, that never will work here. We don't have the time. There's something else more important. We don't have the money. Oh look, there's this other problem. Uh, it's the same situation. Whenever you are trying to bring a change to a social system, there are going to be some dynamics, and that's what I call change dynamics. Many people call change dynamics. So yes, many of you, I've been there. I was training myself in Scrum and Kanban and Less and Safe and Design Thinking and Lean Startup and Business Model Generation Canvas, but I wasn't learning enough about change dynamics. So my uh, approach was to try to convince people with data, with information, like, like see this information, see this data. It proves uh, that agile is better than waterfall, whatever. But then when I started learning about change dynamics, I realized and I learned that facts are not enough. You will never convince your managers, you will never convince your colleagues 
with information, with data, with facts alone. If we were able to convince people with facts, with data, all of you here in this room would be eating five to seven pieces of fruit and vegetable a day, and you will be doing like three to four hours of moderate cardio exercise a week. Because science, data, facts show that it's a good way to be more energized, more happy, have a better health, be in better shape. And are you doing that? No. Why? You don't have the time. It doesn't work for you. <laughs> I went to the supermarket yesterday, we bought brownies. There's a new episode of Game of Thrones today. Brownies, Game of Thrones, you get it? <laughs> so you would never convince people with data, with facts. It's like, you know, cigarettes. You buy a packet of cigarettes and it says, cigarette can give you cancer, it's bad for your health. And people are like, no shit, I didn't know. <laughs> Said nobody ever. <laughs> but we keep doing that, okay? We believe that we, we give information to people people will change. But people doesn't change with information because people are not rational beings. They are rationalizing beings. We are emotional beasts, okay? Let me show you something. Maybe some of you know about this experiment. Maybe some of you don't. Uh, let's see, let's, another, pray, <laughs> another prayer, oops, sorry, I broke it. <laughs> Shall I unplug it and plug it again? Probably it's on my side, whoops, unplug it. You know, the old, <laughs> the good old, have you tried unplugging it and plugging it again? <laughs> yeah, that's always work. <laughs> so, okay, there's this experience, experiment called the, the capuchin monkey experiment, okay? So in this experiment, we have two capuchin monkeys in two separate cages, and we teach the monkeys to use these tokens, these coins, to buy food. They are buying cucumber, and these monkeys, they love cucumber. But at a given moment, the experimental guy, the, the, the guy in the, in the lab, he's going to start treating the, guy, the monkey on the right with grapes instead of cucumber. And these monkeys, they love cucumber, but they love absolutely, are, they are amazed by grapes. So now, let's see what happens. We don't have sound? No, we don't have sound. Anyway, so I'm going to tell you, the monkey in the left is seeing that the other monkey is getting grapes, so he gets so excited. Mm? He's like, oh my god, now there's grapes, I want grapes, I need one grape. So now he gets a token, he gives a token to the lab guy, and he gets a slice of cucumber. And see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, he's like really pissed off, no? And he's like, where's my grapes? Now he tests the rock, he tests the coin, like is this broken or what? And he gives the coin again to the lab guy and he gets another slice of cucumber. This time, he don't even <laughs> taste it. <laughs> and you know, he's not angry at the, at the other monkey, he's angry at the manager, who is the one giving the bonuses and the salaries, if you don't get the parallelism. <laughs> okay, so, um, this is a set of experiments that was done in order to understand if, uh, if we apes or we monkeys or we, you know, from an anthropological way, uh, point of view, is justice something that we learn from society or is it deep wired in our brains? And guess what? It is deep wired. And it's totally irrational because you are getting cucumber for free, okay? You're getting cucumber for free and you're so happy until you realize that someone else is getting grapes. Now you are not happy anymore. It's the same cucumber, it's still for free, but you're not happy anymore. <laughs> and that's the reason we cannot convince people with facts. The fact that you are getting free cucumber and the fact that nothing has changed. Now you are like, but this is bullshit, he's getting grapes, and you are not happy anymore. So, um, so it's so difficult, right? But still, change happens. Some people are like, no, things never change. Change is the sign of the times and is the sign of society. We are constantly evolving and changing. Sometimes the problem is that change is slow and we are not able to see the process. Or sometimes we are so focused on the negative things instead of the positive things. And that's also uh, a mechanism of the mind, okay? But change happens, it happens constantly, okay? Uh, let's do a small exercise just to get you uh, energized. I want each of you, we're going to spend five minutes talking to another person. Yes, it's going to be one of those talks where I ask you to do things in the audience. Only five minutes, but think about for yourself, think about one change that you made in your life over the last year. 
something that you've changed in your life. Maybe you started going to the gym, maybe you started learning a language, maybe you dropped some weight, maybe you cut relationships with some toxic people, maybe you change uh, jobs, I don't know, something that you've changed over the last year that was significant. If you can't find that, first of all, think about it. <laughs> Second of all, maybe you're going to uh, look at something you've changed over the last five years. And when you think about this thing you've able to change over the last year, over the last two years maybe, try to think about three important things. One, what started the change? What was the reason that one day you said, enough? And how was that process? Because there was one day before you decided to start doing things, and there's one day after you decided to start doing things in order to make this change happen. What was that process like? That's the first question. The second question is, what kept you going? What was important in order to support your effort in order to make this change? Something maintained you in that change in mindset and give you the energy and the discipline and the will to keep going. What was that? And then the third thing that I would like you to reflect about is how did that change affect you over the long term and how did it affect others around you. You may not have realized that this thing that you change on yourself had also an impact on other people around you. And I now want you to find someone close to you, maybe somebody you do not like. I, no, you don't like, sorry. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> somebody you don't know, maybe, and then interview that person. Okay, you, you have uh, uh, two minutes each, four minutes to interview that person about you don't have to tell them about the change. Maybe the change is very personal, but you can say, there's something that changed in my life. This is the uh, circumstances around the beginning of the change. This is what maintained the change going, and this is how the change affected me and how the change affected others. Four minutes, go. Come on, come on, come on, find someone. Energy. <laughs> nope, that's no sign. One minute.
That was cool. How many of you already knew about this trick? You see someone raising their hand, and then you raise your hand, and you close your conversation. How many of you knew about this trick? Okay, a lot of people knew about this trick, okay. <laughs> nice, so it's a good way of bringing back the attention, even if there's like 400, 500 people in a, in a room, if you're doing a big room planning or whatever, it's a very good way to like bringing everyone together to the topic or just maintaining some structure. So. What you might have dis uh, discovered in this conversation, maybe, I don't know, is that there's patterns. There's like, hey, that's similar to what I was thinking about. Or if you think about several different change processes that you have been through, there's patterns, there's things that repeat over and over and over. And there's some people that have been collecting these patterns and talking about how change happens for a long time. And you have some ideas, some books that you might want to uh, review here. Like for instance, one of my personal all-time favorites is Fearless Change by Marianne Ling and Linda Rising. I had the immense privilege to uh, listen to Linda a couple of times. She's like such an amazing human being, and she has uh, this deep knowledge, deep connection with humans. And Fearless Change is a huge connection of patterns on how change happens in different companies. Uh, there's, uh, it's written in pattern language, which is a little bit painful to read, but it's also um, a very good way to understand how, how things go. No? Um, so yes, patterns. For instance, uh, you might have stumbled across the ADGAR pattern. ADGAR, it's a change management model, a change model that says that there's five things needed for individuals to change. And I apply the same to organizations. You need first, the A is for awareness. You need to understand what's the problem we're trying to solve. Then there's the D, desire. You need to make it your problem. Why do you care about that problem? And then you need the K, which is knowledge. You need to know about how that problem might be solved. You need the A, ability. You need time to practice. You need environment, tools, some support. And then there's the R, which is reinforcement. Many times, the problem that people don't change is that they, they don't have the awareness. Hmm? Like you are gaining weight, gaining weight, gaining weight, and you're like, no, I'm just healthy, OK? <laughs> and then somebody shows you your medical results, and you're like, oh my god, I'm going to die. And then you're like, suddenly you are like, OK, this is a problem. But then some people, you are showing them medical results, and they are like, well, I don't care about those. I just prefer to enjoy my life. Well, that's a desire problem. This person knows that he's going to die or she's going to die. He doesn't care. And you keep showing information to that person instead of working the desire, which would be, wouldn't you like to meet your grandchildren? And then suddenly he's like, oh, tell me more about that diet. Because it's not a matter of awareness, it's a matter of desire. Many organizations, they have an awareness problem. They don't understand why they need agility or why agility is a solution. To what problems? Like, what is the problem we're trying to solve here? They don't know. They even lack the desire. They are like, oh, yeah, it seems like the thing we should do now because everyone is doing it. Not desire, not enough desire. And then you buy a bunch of certifications and training. Knowledge, 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 knowledge. And you keep working the knowledge when you don't have awareness and you don't have desire. So Adgar, usually for me as a consultant, it's a good tool to try to understand what's happening here. Why is this company not changing? It is a matter of awareness. It is a matter of desire, of knowledge. And then there's more. You probably know the uh, Rogers curve, the diffusion of innovation, also made very popular by Geoffrey A. Moore, who wrote a book, Crossing the Chasm, when he talks, where he talks about how when you introduce new products into a market, when the innovators introduce new ideas, there's always like 2.5, 3.5% of the people, early adopters, that love it. But then there's like 85 of the people that say no for different reasons. You have an early majority, people that want to change, but they are like, yeah, but who's going to be the Scrum Master? And who's going to be the product owner? And where should we start? And how do I do the project management tools now? And how do I um, uh, do the budget? And where do I put the charges? And how do I assign people to the teams? And I'm like, dude, just do it. But these are early, early majority. What they are asking for is support, training, like make it easy to follow. And then there's the late majority, skeptics, no, but they give you a rational, uh, argument because they are not doing it. No, because our contract with our suppliers prevent us from doing it. So if you listen to the late majority, if you listen to the skeptics, you will build a, a collection of impediments. And if you try to work those impediments, then the skeptics will become early majority. You will say, hey, we changed the contract with our suppliers. Now we can have them working with us in our building. And they will say, uh, yeah, but where will we sit them? Now they are early majority. <laughs> The language change, the concerns change. And you have to, if you try to, um, 
treat, uh, if you try to interact with uh, laggards or late majority in the same way you are interacting with early majority or early adopters, it doesn't work. Early adopters, they are asking for encouragement, support, like incubating them. You try that with laggards, which are the people that are against the change because of emotional reasons, like they fear the change, and you're like, yay, let's do it. They're going to hate you because they're saying, no, I won't do that. I hate it. And you're like, let's get started. <laughs> they hate you even more because you're not using the appropriate language, the appropriate approach. So the more you learn about the people that surround you and how change will traverse over that curve, if it's an awareness problem, a desire problem, a knowledge problem, my goal is not to teach you how to use these tools here. My goal is to transmit you the idea that these tools exist. And the more you know about these tools, the more efficient, the more effective you will be in making change happen in your environments. So just to close the, the talk, there's like 12 minutes to go. I had 21 ways to convince your managers and your colleagues about Agile or whatever. I don't have enough time. Let's make that 10 ways, 10 ways to convince your managers. <laughs> 10 is a good number, come on. <laughs> so number one, empathize. Most of the time when I go to companies and I see people struggling to, to uh, convince their colleagues and their managers, it comes to a point where you start saying, I am surrounded by idiots. Uh, that's not a good, if you don't love your customers, and if you don't fall in love with the problem your customers have, then you will never get to do amazing products. You fall in love with the product, with the idea, oh, I love Agile, and I hate the people that I'm trying to imply Agile upon. Right? I'm trying to put Agile on top of this myriad of stupid damn asses. Well, that's not a good point to start. So start by empathizing with those people. What are the fears they're having? What are the problems they're facing? What is the, so, so uh, try to, you know, Create a user persona for the early adopter in your organization. Create a user persona for the laggard in your organization. Same thing you do with your customers and try to understand how are these people reacting to our, uh, our um, change initiative. Number two, find the early adopters, okay? Um, Everyone focuses on the wrong people. Everyone focuses on the lagger. When, I, when I'm training people and companies, they are like, Angel, uh, I do have a question. And yes, there's this person in my team. He's like very arrogant. He has a big ego and he's very aggressive. And he never shares. He wants to keep everything for himself. He's not a team player and he's usually so violent. He's also an alcoholic, a drug addict. He beats his wife. He's stealing from the company. So how do we coach this person? And I'm like, dude. <laughs> Fuck my life. And, like, and I'm like, okay, maybe we can. Can you do like some kind of coaching with this person? And I'm like, dude, coaching is like, not like a Jedi mind trick, okay? Like, these are not the bots you are looking for. <laughs> Agile is the new way of going. Uh, I mean, I can talk about, we can maybe understand how to do some coaching with this person, but there's another six guys saying, hey, when do we start? Focus on those ones. You know, change doesn't happen because you convince the laggards. Change happens because you nurture the early adopters. You nurture that small amount of people that will really make the change. Mm? Remember that because I will come back to this idea at the end of the talk. Um, number three, learn the language. Learn how to speak to managers. Learn how to speak to salespeople. Learn how to speak to finance people. Most of the time, I've seen a lot of agile people falling into the mistake of speaking to top managers and then starting to talk about uh, automated unit testing and test-driven development and peer programming. And then you see the managers and their, their neurons are trying to skate their brains by their ears, through their ears, right? Because they're like, dude, <laughs> who, who brought this guy to the meeting? <laughs> You have to learn the language of Mordor if you want to go to Mordor, okay? And that is something that the safe people did very, very good. I know, safe, boo, boo, safe, boo. One of the only reasons I'm mentioning safe in this presentation is that because I know that Alexei was in the last conference like two or three months ago, and I just wanted to fuck with him. Where's Alexei? Yay! <laughs> Give him a hand! Yay, Alexei! <laughs> But SAFE learn how to present the ideas in cute PowerPoints, big pictures, infographs, PowerPoint, Accenture-like, Gardner-like, Everest-like, McKinsey-like presentations. They learn the language. And that's one of the reasons they became so ubiquitous in big companies. They learn the language. Maybe there's something you can learn from that approach, even if you are not interested in SAFE. Number four. Raise awareness. Instead of selling, uh, let me ask you a question. How many people in the first world are willing, are wanting to be on a diet? How many people in the first world 
are wanting to diet, are willing to go in a diet? How many? One? <laughs> Zero! Good, good answer. Nobody wants to go in a diet. I live in a diet. It sucks, okay? It's terrible. Nobody wants to live in a diet. But you want to look good. You want to be healthy. You want your clothes to fit you. You want to go to the beach and don't feel bad about your body. You want to lay down in your bed and don't fall by both the sides at the same time. <laughs> You want to step in the scale in the mornings and not listen to that dumb motherfucker scale saying, please, one by one. And you're like, fuck you. <laughs> you don't want that. And then you go in a diet. So instead of speaking to the customers and your company about the diet, which is agility, which is hard. Nobody wants to do agile. Agile is hard. Agile is expensive. Agile is really hard. Agile hurts at the beginning but you want to see the results so start talking about the results we're willing to see and start talking about the problems we are having and once we agree these are the problems that's how you start selling the the idea um, i think it was the former leonard cohen who said there's always a crack in the wall that's how the light gets in isn't it beautiful right so maybe you want to try something called pain-driven facilitation. The first time I heard about that, I was like, that sounds good. <laughs> when do I start inflicting pain? And they were like, no, 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 stop. Pain-driven facilitation is about asking the people, what's your biggest pain? And then they are like, oh, everyone is asking things at the same time. And you're like, hmm, how about we put one guy in the front and he will deal with that? And then we ha he will create a one prioritized list of the things that we should be uh, focusing on. And then you try that and people are like, wow, that's amazing. It's solving our problem. And guess what? You have implemented the backlog and product owner patterns and you didn't even talk about Agile or Scrum. You ask them, what's your biggest problem? And then you try to figure out how to solve that problem. Okay, so raise awareness, sell the problem, find the cracks, and then do organic agility. Like, try to bring things when they are needed. Not just because the framework says so, you have to implement everything. No, just find the next problem, as we do in Agile teams, and try to propose solutions to those problems. Number five. Think progress, not event. Everyone sees the event. Everyone sees the day that the top executive says, now we are going agile and we're going to put money in that and we're going to bring consultants. Oh, amazing. The company changed overnight. Overnight change is a, it's a myth. Change always takes a lot of time. Some people saw the day that, uh, I don't know, uh, when in South Africa they gave uh, full rights to the black population and everyone was like, wow, South Africa changed overnight. And Nelson Mandela, who had been 40 years in jail, he was like, overnight my ass. <laughs> I've been banging this jail for 40 years and now you say it's changed overnight, dude. No? Or it's like in the civil rights in the United States or it's the fall of the Berlin Wall. If you see the full story, it started way back in time, but we always see the event. We always see when the branch breaks because that single snowflake fell in the, in the branch and it broke. And everyone says, look, it was that snowflake. No, it was the accumulation of snowflakes until the weight was too much. So you just keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, and think about small increments and look for sometimes for temporary compromises because we all want the big change immediately. People are like, how long is it going to take? That's so uh, a wrong question. We should be asking, what's the next move? If we are agile people, how long is it going to take? It's like fixed scope, fixed time, fixed budget. Instead of asking, what's the next big problem we can solve in a small sprint? So think process, not event, and think on small increments instead of big ass projects, change projects. So again, <laughs> yeah, that makes. Again, safe. It's a good way to start going with something that is very, very structured. Uh, but the company loves it because it looks like a blueprint, okay? And, but the thing is, do not st stop there. If you go the safe way, that's okay. Just understand that that's one way to start moving the company, but then over time, you will like to de-scale of these, all these structures and give more autonomy to the teams and maybe get rid of some of the layers. But maybe, just maybe, something very structured and very prescribed and very dis uh, defined might be a temporary compromise that you would like to use in your long-term goal of making your company more agile. Six, there's four to go and I have to close the, 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 the talk and I have three minutes. Make it easy. Create a clear vision. 
you ask people, let's be agile. And then some people are like, well, what does agile mean? And for some people, agile is no documents. For some people, uh, agile means no managers, no bosses. Yay, anarchy. <laughs> For some people, Agile means we don't know what we're going to be delivering over the next three months. Then for some people, Agility is cross-functional teams. For some people, Agility is poses on the wall. No wonder that there's a mess created in the company because there's no clear idea. This is what we are trying to sell. Something that gave a very, very simple idea on what's Agility is Alistair Coburn, Heart of Agility. If you haven't checked that yet, it's a very clever idea. Four things. Agility is about delivering, collaborating, reflecting, improving. That's it. Usually I say it's about focusing on value, early and frequent delivery of value, and then early and frequently, uh, frequent uh, feedback from the customer, adapting to customer needs, constant uh, uh, reflection and improvement. It's the same idea. Four or five things, deliver value frequently, get some feedback, adapt to that feedback, focus on the people, focus on the value. That's agility. And then we can start exploring what that means in your company. And then triple boo, <laughs> again, <laughs> the one success factor of safe, and I'm, tr I'm not trying even, I'm not even renewing as an SPC, okay? I'm not even doing any safe trainings anymore, I'm tired of this, but it has proven to be a good tool to Keep the people moving, and for top executives, when they see a blueprint and they're like, here's me, <laughs> that's me over there, and these are the teams, and this is the roadmap, they are like, I get it now. Whereas if you give something very like smoke, vaporous, principles, values, they don't get it. The more simple and the more specific you can make it, the better. We say agile, we say agility, most of the people are getting wrong ideas about what does that mean. Seven. Look for quick wins. Try to show things to people to make them see that this is actually working. Even if it is small, quick wins, like showing, hey, hey, now we have boards and we know what the teams are working on. Or now I have an idea of capacity. Or hey, if your customer is seeing some kind of delivery and they are happy, record a video with your customer. Can you say that to the camera? Oh, I'm so happy with this. Thank you so much. It's been great. It's very easy that if your customer has been living in a waterfall environment for a long time, the first time they experience a small, project they're gonna be so excited record that and then move that video around because even motivation and engagement and excitement it's a quick win if you're having the same results for the same price the same revenue but people are happier <laughs> that's even a quick win okay so that's even better than whatever we had before and then you keep going you keep presenting new things that we are winning with this approach number eight Look elsewhere, do not focus just on your company, come to these conferences, talk to people, go to trainings, create communities of practice, go to your local Agile community, travel around, read books, because chances are other people have been where you are now. So there's ideas and there's approaches, and you might try those approaches in your situations. Do not try to reinvent the wheel all the time. Nine, piggyback, this is a good one, if there's any initiative in your company called, for instance, the digital transformation, and that has a lot of inertia, a lot of momentum going on, try to piggyback on that. Oh, we are going digital transformation. You know what's amazing for digital transformations? Agility. And then try to make it about the digital transformation because that huge movement already has the attention of the right people. If you have um, a movement in your company about attracting talent, you know what attracts talent? Agility. <laughs> and then you make agility about attracting and keeping talent because fresh, new, uh, amazing talent, they are used to work in an agile way. If we put them in a very bureaucratic industrial uh, or environment, they will be demotivated, disengaged, and they will leave. And then suddenly, agility is about attracting talent, keeping talent, because there's already a movement in your company that has the attention of the managers. So it's very, very powerful that you connect your initiative to, to that one. And then number 10, and I will start closing up, get help, okay? Don't do it alone. You are not supposed to be the lone rider. You're not supposed to be the individual hero. You are supposed to rally the troops and create a team of people that are constantly moving for the transformation of the company. Create that team as soon as possible. That's what uh, Cotter uh, named the, the powerful guiding coalition in his books about change. Create a powerful guiding coalition, a change management team, and make that their main uh, uh, dedication. So, in order to close my talk, when everything else fails, try the Jedi mind trick. The Jedi mind trick. You want to be agile. It's not going to work, but you're going to look super cool, okay? <laughs> and in a more serious uh, uh, 
in a more serious way, you may want to try the serenity prayer, which is something that, uh, that you learn from many schools. I learned it through Buddhism and Zen practice. And it says something like, Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the, ch the things I can't change, the courage to change the ones I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Sometimes we have to choose our battles and focus on the one things that we are able to change, but keep changing something. What I'm trying to, to call people is into militant agility. Do not just talk about agility and complain about how other people are not doing agility right. If you are passionate about this thing and you are on a Saturday here in a conference, you are called and you are required to become part of the agile army, like the, the Kaizen army, and you are a change agent. You should start uncomfortable conversations with everyone around your environment. And then some people will follow those conversations. Because at the end of the day, last words, <laughs> Morihei Ueshiba, the founder of Aikido, is a martial art I have been practicing for a long time. He used to say, life is about growth. If we don't grow, both technically and spiritually, we are as dead. So life is about growth. And I think that we should be living in this idea of stop thinking this is the life I've been given. Stop this fixed mindset. We have to cultivate a growth mindset. Everything is possible if we have the right commitment to it. And then this is Mohi Shiva, and this is Lao Tzu, the founder of uh, Taoism. As you see, they look really, really alike, uh, okay? These Chinese gurus, Japanese gurus, when they are old, they, are, they all look like very, very alike. Sorry for the racist joke. <laughs> um, um, Lao Tzu uses to say, um, the job of the leader is better when his presence is not noticed. When the job is done, when the battle is won, people would say, we did it ourselves. And this is key. For some time, I wanted to be the hero, the change agent, the one people, the one person people identified as the, the, the hero of the journey and the one that fought the, uh, fought the dragons. And that's not your role as change agents. Um, look at this, the 3.5% rule. And I really encourage you to read the articles and see the TED talk. Basically, uh, this lady, Erika Shenoweth, I hope I pronounced that right, she studied several social movements across the 20th century, and she found that once 3.5% of the population is active, there's no way you can stop that. 3.5%, that's all you need in order to make a change happen. But I'm talking about 3.5% of the company really passionate about the change, really active about the change, opening the conversation. Something that she found is that peaceful transformations, peaceful movements across many countries, across many cultures were way more effective and long lasting than violent military movements, okay? So if you start a peaceful movement in your company with 3.5% of, of, your, of your people, there's nothing you can't do. So your goal is not to change your company. Your, jo your, your job is to awake the giant. At the end of People Were by Tom DeMarco and Timothy Lister, they said that there's this uh, legend in Denmark where they say there's a hidden sli uh, sleeping giant underground, Holger Dansk, and they say, if someday Denmark is in danger, Holger Dans will awake and defend the country. And they say, your job is not to defend Denmark. Your job is to awake the giant. And the giant is the collective force of all the people that are in your company, that are in your culture. So go and awake the giant. Thank you. <laughs>